a dietician was a keynote speaker at a convention and said that dietician, we are killing ourselves with the things that we are putting into our bodies. Raw, or pardon me, red meat is terrible. I suppose raw meat wouldn't be that good either. <laughs> red meat is terrible. And oh my goodness, the dietician went on to say, the soft drinks that are consumed in our culture, they're just empty calories and soft drinks are loaded with sodium. And then there's the fast food culture in which we live in which so many people are ingesting fat food meals that are laden with cholesterol and MSG. All of these things are so detrimental to our bodies and to our health. But there is one food, said this dietitian, that is the most problematic of all. It has the potential to cause trouble in our lives for years and years to come. Can anyone tell me what that food is? And an older person seated in the front row piped up, wedding cake. <laughs> Anytime that you would bring together two people as diverse as a man and a woman into a relationship of incredible relational proximity like marriage, there are bound to be challenges, right? But our Father in Heaven, who is the architect of the marriage relationship, which in his beautiful and wise plan would be one man and one woman committing themselves to their God for a lifetime, the architect of the marriage relationship also wants us to succeed at that. Amen? And this passage of Scripture provides us with three basic principles now, fundamental principles for aligning ourselves with God's purpose for our marriages that the result for God's honor and glory might be joy and strength in our marriages and in our homes. But just before we jump into the text, three truisms about marriage. He would, here would be the first. Healthy marriages don't just magically happen. Growing healthy marriages are the product of time plus effort plus prayer. Secondly, most every marriage could grow significantly if husband and wife will just seize hold of a little determination and intentionality. I truly believe that. And that truth alone should be an encouragement to anyone who may be in a place in their marriage where you're wrestling a little bit. And thirdly, because God is the designer of the marriage relationship, we need to seek His blueprint so that we might be on side with what he wants to do in our lives and in our homes to bring about his strength. And that brings us now to this passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the first five verses. And contained in those verses now, again, are three fundamental principles for partnering with the Spirit of God to invite the strength and the joy of our Lord Jesus into our marriages and into our homes. The first principle is this, my friends. Marriage is a spiritual relationship. Marriage is a spiritual relationship. Paul acknowledges that in the fifth verse where he writes, Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. In that fifth verse, Paul made a profound assumption. He assumed God's highest plan for a marriage relationship. And what would God's highest plan and will be for a marriage relationship? That would be that a man who is a genuine follower of Christ Jesus would come together in a lifelong marriage covenant with a woman who is also a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. When a man and a woman come together now, having individually yielded themselves to Christ Jesus as the only one who could forgive them of their sins and lead their lives, then in the marriage relationship, you have a man and a woman who are already made one by the Spirit of the living God. Without question, that provides a sound foundation for marriage with which nothing else can compare. That's God's highest game plan. Now, for a person who may be married to someone who does not share their faith in Christ Jesus, may I encourage you, just pray earnestly for God's grace to be upon your life and for God, through 
a gentle and quiet spirit reflected out of you to be an encouragement to touch your spouse and point them to the Lord Jesus Christ who loves them dearly. What's for sure in that circumstance is as we call it to our God, we can know with absolute certainty that our God is working overtime in the case of the spouse who has not yet yielded their lives in faith to Jesus to draw that person into the heart of God. We know that. But as we come to this passage of Scripture now, Paul assumes God's highest plan for marriage, which is a man and a woman who are genuinely followers of Jesus, and they come together in the marriage relationship. In fact, as is implied in that fifth verse, Paul envisioned a husband and wife now, openly sharing in the joy of praying together, of seeking the face of God together, and experiencing the exciting journey of growing in Christ Jesus together. That's God's best game plan. Now in these verses, Paul talks as well about a husband and wife in a situation now who have abstained from sexual intimacy for a period of time, and he cautions them. He says, be careful about that, because what? Paul acknowledges in that fifth verse that we have an enemy. Now, my friends, as husbands and wives, individually and together, lean into the Lord Jesus, obviously, we are inviting the grace and the strength of God into our homes. That is absolutely the truth, and how desperately we need that. But there's another spiritual dynamic at work, and Paul acknowledges it in the fifth verse, and that's the reality of enemy attack. And so his admonition in that fifth verse is be careful in terms of sharing your sexual intimacy one with another husband and wife. Don't live in that realm of abstinence too long because you might unwittingly give the enemy an opportunity to exploit a vulnerability and tempt a husband and wife now to seek their sexual fulfillment outside of their marriage relationship. And again, who's powerfully at work to promote the kind of destruction that that wreaks in a marriage, that is the enemy of God and all that's righteous, our enemy, Satan himself. So let's think about that for a second. What would be some of the ways that we need to be heads up in our marriages because the devil's the real deal and he is at work to bring destruction and if not that, at least difficulty into our marriages and into our homes. For sure, and Paul clearly speaks to this in that fifth verse, the enemy is at work to promote marital infidelity in our marriages. So be careful, says the word of God. But the enemy is also at work in our marriages, I would say, in this realm. Again, to try and sow discontentment and discord. He will bring into our lives the lie that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. If only I hadn't married the person that I've married. If only we hadn't had three kids in three years. If only, if only, if only. The evil one would love for us to camp out in if-only land. Here's the reality. If you're married, then you're married to that person, correct? So God would say, guess what? Can we just do away with the lie of the enemy and this if-only kind of thinking? Lean into the grace of God, seize hold of what is, not what might have been, and choose by God's grace to love the person that he's brought into your life. This myth of the greener grass thing, that is just nothing but a lie from the evil one. But he will sow that deception in our ears to try and promote discontent and discord in our marriages. And Paul again in that fifth verse acknowledges we've got an enemy. Don't be naive to that fact. Lean into Christ Jesus. Find grace and strength in him for it's in our Lord Jesus that we find supernatural power to stand up against the enemy and his deceptive devices. Amen? Here's another way the evil one will try and move into our marriages and into our homes and cause us problems. The devil likes to try and exploit unresolved conflict. Pardon me, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 26 and 27, God's word says, Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. In our marriages, we got to be super, super careful about this. 
Unresolved conflict, as Paul notes in that scripture, gives the evil one the opportunity to move into our marriages and mess with us. Now, I don't know about you, but every once in a while I hear or read of these individuals that say, we've been married for 40 years and we've never argued and fought once. I've just got to tell you, my marriage, is, my marriage hasn't been quite that boring. Conflict in a marriage is a bad case of the normals. It's not will we have conflict, it's what will we do with it. And God's admonition in those verses from Ephesians chapter 4 is powerful for the marriage relationship. Husbands and wives purpose together that you will not go to bed angry with one another. If it means some later nights because you refuse to sweep something under the carpet and instead you're going to talk it out and ask for God's grace to be a part of what's going on, believe me, the late night investment will be worth it. Or sometimes, because I totally believe, Gracie and I believe, that no good decisions are made after 11 in the evening, it might mean that when there's conflict there, a husband and wife will say, okay, we are not going to turn a blind eye to this. At a later date, time, and place, we will re-engage this conversation. But we just want to be able to go to sleep tonight knowing that we've at least resolved it to that point because we do not want to give the enemy a foothold in our relationship. When we purpose to embrace in obedience this word of God and push back at the enemy and the way in which he wants to use unresolved conflict to sow discord in our marriages, do you know what we have done? We have literally removed from the devil's arsenal one of his choice weapons to bring trouble into our marriages. He wants to use discord to drive a wedge of bitterness between a husband and between a wife. So beware of unresolved conflict. Take the word of God word for word there and don't go to bed, to sleep, angry with your spouse. Talk it out. Work it out. Here would be maybe one more way in which we need to be careful because we have an enemy who is working overtime against us, but in Christ Jesus we're strong. Here would be one more way that we need to be careful. And it would be this lie that the enemy wants us to buy into that love is a feeling that comes and goes. Later on in this series, God willing, in about three weeks' time, we're going to focus a message specifically on biblical love that God places in the heart of a wife and a husband for their spouse. But let us simply say this morning that this notion that love is a feeling that comes and goes is nothing short of a lie from the enemy. Love is not a feeling that comes and goes, at least not biblical love. Love is not some warm, fuzzy thing that when it's gone, move on. Biblical love is a decision. It's a decision to love, to comfort, to honor, to keep one another, forsaking all others as long as you both shall live. That's a choice. And as we choose to do it and lean into God, he gives us grace to live out that decision, that commitment. The ancient Greeks had a unique race that was a part of the ancient Olympic Games. The 10 cent word for it was Lampadodromia. And what was unique about the race was the winner was not the first person to cross the finish line. The winner was the person who crossed the finish line with their torch still lit. Now that race is at least in part the forerunner of our modern Olympic torch relay. But the winner again was the person who crossed the finish line with their torch lit. Now let's think of that in a spiritual sense. That's what I want to be about. Are you with me? Leaning into Jesus every day so that by God's grace... At some point down the road, we're going to cross the finish line with our torch burning for our Lord. Husbands and wives, if we will own that individually now before God in our marriages, grant me grace, Lord Jesus. Today, your strength by your Holy Spirit to run the race in a way that you call me to. I know that my hope is in you, and it's only by your strength that I will accomplish this, but by your strength, I can do it. 
as we run the race with our torch, let you know what we're doing. We are actually, whether we perceive it or not, inviting the strength, the presence, the power, and the peace of our Lord Jesus into our marriages. May God grant us strength in that regard. Because again, fundamentally, marriage is a spiritual relationship. And as we grow in Jesus, husbands and wives, we grow together in our marriages. Amen? Here's the second thing that Paul says. Marriage is a sacrificial relationship. A young couple anticipates their marriage and they think to themselves, he is a great guy or she th he thinks that she's a great girl and, uh, and, but they got some rough edges, but that's okay. We'll get married and I'll change them. I'll make them into the person I know they really need to be. And God's word would say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Marriage isn't about marrying the right person or changing that person. What it is is it's about being the right person. And a profound aspect of being the person that God calls us to be in the marriage would be this, that we embrace the servant heart of our Lord Jesus Christ toward our spouse. Look at verses 4 and 5. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent. I love the way Peter said in the message gives us that fourth verse. He writes, marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights. Marriage is a decision to serve the other, whether in bed or out. And then Paul in that fifth verse adds those two words, mutual consent. In other words, this is a picture of a wife and of a husband who individually now before their Lord God have acknowledged that the call of God upon their lives is to bless and serve and lift up and affirm the other. Now clearly in context... Paul is talking about the sexual relationship, and we'll come around to that one in a moment. But the principle here that transcends sharing ourselves sexually within a marriage between a husband and wife, which is so important, is that in general in the marriage, God calls a husband and a wife, one to another, before their Lord God, to seek to serve their spouse. Where in a marriage, you have a husband and you have a wife saying, Father God, I understand that I am inherently selfish. And if I'm not careful, it easily becomes all about me. But that's not your calling upon my life. Grant me grace by your spirit now instead to live after the model of Christ Jesus, who in humility sought to serve everybody else. When we embrace that in our marriages by God's grace and we bring a serving posture, do you know what you also have? When husband and wife serve each other as unto the Lord Jesus, you've got strength and joy in Jesus' name. When it's about serving. Carl was on his way to work one morning when he was involved in a fender bender with another motorist. The woman got out of her vehicle. She was immediately distraught. And I get it because I have caused some fender benders in my life and it's a great way to ruin a day. But she was troubled. She admitted the accident was totally her fault. And then she added this compounding bit of information. The vehicle was just days out of the showroom. What would she tell her husband? And Carl was genuinely sympathetic. But they had to proceed with the appropriate exchanging of information. And uh, so she went to the glove, bo glove box to get the necessary documents. And as she opened the documents, out fell a handwritten letter. And it was written by her husband. And it said, in case of accident, remember, honey, I love you, not the car. That's awesome. <laughs> that is a husband who clearly, somewhere along the way, said, here's the deal. Before God, I choose to embrace this value of serving, blessing, and exalting my wife. And that's going to be at the top of the heap instead of a bunch of other things that might be. And that is powerful. My prayer for us, dear friends, 
and for husbands and wives is that we would embrace before the Lord our God this servant heart which was in our Christ Jesus who came to planet earth as the very son of God not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. If we will embrace a serving posture for our spouse, wow, just watch God by his spirit step in and bring about growth and vitality and joy in our marriages. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul puts it this way. These are great words for any relationship and so appropriate for marriage. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships, one with another, have the same mindset as Christ. As we ask Jesus for help and grace, he will supernaturally energize us to live that servant dynamic toward our spouse. And God will bless it. Well, here's the third fundamental for marriage that's reflected in this passage of Scripture. Marriage is a spiritual relationship. Marriage is a sacrificial relationship. And marriage is a sexual relationship. This passage of Scripture makes that so abundantly evident. Look at verses 1 and 2. Now, for matters you wrote about, it's good for a man not to marry. But since there is so much immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. In the surrounding verses, Paul is going to make an argument, a very valid argument, for singleness. And Paul's argument is this. Think about the energy and commitment before God that it takes to grow a marriage. It takes a lot of that. In Paul's case, he said, in my life, I'm going to take that energy that would necessarily have to be given to growing a marriage, and I'm going to invest it in the kingdom of God. And in that way, Paul says that in God's calling upon an individual life, singleness can be a very powerful and valid and god honoring calling. Paul acknowledges that in the first verse. But then in verse 2, he says, Now for every husband and wife, understand this then. That part of what God has given to you and called you to in the marriage relationship is this. That your marriage would be marked by the joyful celebration of God's gift of sexuality. In fact, a marriage relationship where a man and a woman commit themselves before God to each other for their lives. That is God's place for the gift of sexuality to be celebrated. But when we're talking about the celebration of sexuality here, we're not just talking about intercourse. There's more than that. In fact, the word that's translated Mary in verse 1 of chapter 7 in NIV is not a great translation. The word literally there would mean to touch. But it's a euphemism for touching with the specific intent of sexual arousal. So what Paul was reminding his readers in Corinth, as he is to us today, our sexuality, which is a gift from God, in all of its multi faceted aspects the place in God's wise design for all of those aspects of our sexuality to be expressed is in the context of a marriage relationship now make no mistake the words that are recorded in this passage of scripture that Paul would have proclaimed to the followers of Jesus in the church at Corinth this would have been absolutely radically countercultural because first century Corinth, as was the case for most great Roman cities of that era, sexual promiscuity was an absolute way of life. Most individuals had sexual partners in the numbers in their lives. First century Corinth, in fact, boasted, if that's the right word, 1,500 prostitutes at the temple Diana. And in their twisted way of looking at things, it was an act of worship to go to the temple to the goddess of Diana and engage in sex with one of the temple prostitutes. Into that world now comes the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and the servant of the gospel, Paul, and he says, whoa, 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 whoa. God's plan is so radically different than that. 
God has given to you the gift of sexuality, but here's God's game plan for sharing in and celebrating that gift, and it's in the context of a marriage relationship. It was a radical message for that day. It's a countercultural message for our day, but it's God's unchanging word. So as was the case for the Corinthians of old in our day today, it's vitally important that in terms of the way in which we think and our conduct, we say to God, I get it, and I embrace your truth for the celebration of the gift of sexuality that you have given to me. And that gift is to be shared in the context of a marriage relationship. And there, as these verses make clear, Paul says God celebrates right along with you, and it's two thumbs up. Look at verses 3 and 4. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. A young feller soon to be married was seeking some sage advice from an older married gentleman. And the older gentleman said to the young man, just remember to romance your wife throughout the day because sex begins in the morning. And a smile slowly crept across that young man's face, and he said, sex begins in the morning? All right! Now his enthusiasm, and I get it, may have been a little bit misguided, but I think it reflects at least something of the joy that God celebrates with this incredible gift that he has given to us. This aspect of marriage is actually so important that God would say this is a duty. Now, I don't know that I'd go with the word duty, but that's what God's word says. Think of it this way. Outside of a marriage relationship, sexuality is prohibited by God. Within a marriage relationship, sex is commanded. That's the place in the Father's heart that the sharing of sexuality has in a marriage relationship between a man and a woman. In the verses then, Paul speaks of the sharing joyfully and generously of this gift in, again, the sense of servanthood. Such that a husband and wife would not view their bodies as belonging to them spouse, but as belonging to their spouses. And as a gift then to be shared openly and joyfully one with another. What's for sure is that in God's incredibly beautiful design, the marriage relationship is a sexual relationship that God has given to us to celebrate the gift that he has shared with us. An author and a pastor by the name of Ed Young once said, the ideal marriage is not give and take, it's give and give and give some more. That's the truth. As we purpose now, husbands, wives, to give ourselves first of all to our God. Lord Jesus, grant me your grace and strength to be who you call me to be today in my marriage. And as husbands and wives give themselves sacrificially one to another... In this relationship, it's not about me. You have given to me the joy, the high calling, Father, of serving the special person that you have brought into my life. And as husbands and wives give themselves joyfully one to another in terms of physical intimacy, all of that is aligning ourselves with God's wise purpose for our marriages. And he will show up by the power of his Holy Spirit to bring much joy and vitality and growth and strength into our marriages. Let's pray.